Salvation is something that's very misunderstood. The price of misunderstanding what must what someone must do to be saved can have grave detrimental effects. Let me call you to a time in September many years ago. You see, in the Quran and the Hadith, the supposed sayings of Muhammad, there is a doctrine that Muslims believe that if they're martyred for Allah, that they will assuredly and immediately enter heaven. Yes, I'm speaking about 9-11. But surely men that hijack planes and they're not in war and fly them into towers to kill tons of people have not flown their way to heaven, but have flown their way to hell. You see... All roads don't lead to Albany, and neither do all ways lead to heaven. What is biblical salvation? Salvation is the deliverance by God of a sinner from God's own righteous judgment and wrath. Salvation is the deliverance by God, not by the sinner, from God's own righteous judgment and wrath. You see, God is righteous, and we are not. So how can a righteous God just accept those of us who are not righteous in his sight? Many religions of the world try to appease God's righteousness through good works or merit-based salvation. Maybe praying a certain number of times a day. So the Jews pray three times a day facing Jerusalem. And Muslims pray five times a day, so they up the ante and they face Mecca. And then there's almsgiving and visiting holy sites or those that are considered to be holy sites, going to Jerusalem or Mecca or Rome, and there's a ton of places in India and all kinds of places around the world people go to and they say, if we go here, we'll try to, we will find salvation. And so humanity is jumping through all kind of religious hula hoops trying to earn something that God gives freely. But the question remains, can salvation be earned by humanity? Can the scales of God's justice that he commands and demands be balanced out by the works of mere humans? Paul writes in Romans 6.23, For the wages of sin is death. That's our works. But the gift of God, and you can't earn a gift, is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. He writes again in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9, For by grace you have been saved through faith, which are gifts, and this not of your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. The Scripture's teaching is so simple and so clear and so direct with respect to salvation that even a child can understand it. And just because man has always attempted to earn salvation, recall the Tower of Babel, or you may say Babel, and they try to build a tower to heaven. That's a picture of man trying to earn their own salvation, and God would have none of it. And he confused their languages. You see, can we earn salvation as an Olympic runner can earn a gold medal? Just by pulling ourselves by our own bootstraps and trying the best we can. On our way to go visit the Ark uh, exhibit in the Creation Museum in Kentucky, we sat next to a woman who I found out was a nun. And when I asked her the way of salvation, her response was, I'm just going to do the best that I can. And I said, is that good enough? She goes, it'll be good enough for God. And I began to explain the way of salvation for her, and she rejected it, hook, line, and sinker. And I said, if you can earn your own way of salvation, why did Christ die to provide it if you can just do the best you can? You see, the whole message of the gospel is you cannot just do the best you can and expect to inherit everlasting life. Because then we should just go home and just do the best we can. We don't need to be here. We don't need this book. We can just do the best we can. But we don't, doing the best we can won't do anything for us. We need the best one that God has sent in the Lord Jesus Christ.
And we see here once again, and we eavesdrop on Jonah's prayer and glorious proclamation on how salvation from a holy God can be applied to sinful, wicked enemies of God. Now, let me direct you to Jonah chapter 1 and verse 17. If you don't have a Bible, you can raise your hand and the ushers will bring one to you. And God's word says, And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah. You try training a fish. I don't think you can do it. It's like herding cats, right? We don't have an aqua man. We have an aqua god here. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the belly of that fish, saying, I cried out to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the sea, and the flood surrounded me. All your waves and billows passed over me. Then I said, I'm driven away from your sight. Yet I shall look again upon your holy temple. The waters closed in over me to take my life. The deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped around my head at the roots of the mountains. I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever. Yet you brought up my life from the pit, O Lord my God. When my life was fainting away, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came to you. Into your holy temple. Verse 8. Those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love. But I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will pay. Salvation belongs to the Lord. And the Lord spoke to the fish and it vomited Jonah out upon the dry land. And this morning, the title of this sermon is God's Gracious Salvation. God's Gracious Salvation. And I'm going to focus mostly on verses 8 through 10. And if you want to listen to the sermon leading up to this, they're all on sermon audio. And the two points I have for you this morning is, number one, the Lord of salvation. Because that's where it starts. It doesn't start with a a calling Jonah. It starts with a calling God. And secondly, the impossibility of salvation. So let me backtrack. Jonah is called to go to the most wicked city of his day, to Nineveh. If there was one place you didn't want to go, you didn't want to go to Nineveh. And he flees from God's grace on a ship. And God throws and hurls that storm at the ship. Eventually they throw Jonah overboard. And while dipping under the water, God provides a gracious gracious shelter by appointing a fish to swallow Jonah. It was like a living submarine to save him from drowning. And while he was in this redemptive submarine, God worked in Jonah's heart this great cry in prayer. Salvation is of and from the Lord. And so he starts off, look what he says in verse 8 once again. Those who pay regard to vain idols forsake the hope of steadfast love. When people pay regard to vain idols... Unlike Abraham, who in hope believed against hope, those who look to idols instead of the promises of God, they forsake their hope. They have no hope. Any hope they have is a false hope, which is no hope at all. And why is that? Because idols cannot save sinners from their sin. Idols are vain. They're fruitless. They're void. They're hollow. They're barren. They're like a deserted island, a God-forsaken place. Idols are abundant, and many have built them to worship them. But Jeremiah, in Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 5, Jeremiah calls idols scarecrows in a cucumber field which have no good in them. The psalmist in Psalm 115 and verse 8 wrote, Those who make them become like them, so do all who trust in them. The book of Exodus, which recounts the Ten Commandments. The second commandment forbids God's people from making and worshiping idols. 
which is succeeded from the first commandment, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You see, Israel saw God rain down plagues and plummet her enemies and then proceeded to gloriously lead his people through the Red Sea on dry land and drown all her enemies. Yet when God delivered Israel out of Egypt, what did they quickly do? They built an idol. They made a golden calf. And they called that calf Yahweh. The very one that delivered them through the Red Sea, the very one that plummeted her enemies, they called this idol God. On the ship, we saw the mariners crying out in pantheistic panic to false gods, to idols which proved to be utterly fruitless. In Jonah chapter 1 and verse 5, it says, Then the mariners were afraid, and each cried out to his God. Did any of those gods stop the storm? Not one of them. This is a picture of our neighborhoods and our city, our co-workers, our family member and friends that have been given over to idolatry. You see, the human heart is fully, heartily, and readily given over to idolatry. Why do we find joy in the things that God forbids? Yet we've all done it. Are we not wholly satisfied with God as our portion? Is he our greatest treasure? Why pant over the dust of the earth, Amos 2, 7, and be satisfied with the temporal water of this world when you could drink deeply from the pure river of living water? The Apostle Paul was grieved in Acts chapter 17 when he saw a city given over to idols. There were tons of idols in the Greek world, in the Roman world. They even erected an altar to an unknown god just in case they missed one of the gods. They had a whole pantheon of gods. And this is not unlike what happened on the ship. Everyone called out to their own god just to cover their basis. The captain of the ship then calls Jonah and says, pray to your God, the one you're running from. And that was the only God that calmed the storm. And Paul used this opportunity to proclaim to them the one true God, the one God that they neglected, the only God that was true and real, the only God that could save. Charles Spurgeon said, when we speak of idolatry, we don't need to look to blocks of wood and stone and men that bow down before them. For our native lands swarm with idolaters. Neither do you need to look into the streets to find them. Stay where you are and look in your own hearts. And there you will find idols. And if there are idols in your own hearts, then like Paul, may I preach Christ to you. Because the idols in our hearts cannot save and they must be ejected from the heart. Those in Christ look to Christ and Christ alone. You see, God is the only Savior. In verse 9, Jonah cries out with the voice of thanksgiving, the ESV renders salvation belongs to the Lord. But the New American Standard says, salvation is of the Lord. The New King James, I'm sorry, the New American Standard states, salvation is of the Lord, and New King James, salvation is of the Lord. He is the author, sustainer, and finisher of salvation. He's truly the Alpha and Omega of our salvation. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 10 says, For it is fitting that he for whom and by whom all things exist in bringing many sons to glory should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. And instead of the founder of their salvation, the New King James renders this the captain of, of their salvation. Believers have inherited a sonship in Christ as Christ is the captain of their salvation. He leads his people into salvation, the very salvation he secured. You see, many people try to be the captain of their own ship. They try to do it their way. Guess where you're going to steer yourself if you're the captain of your own ship? You won't be steering yourself to heaven. 
I can assure you that according to God's word. This salvation is truly and utterly perfect. It's complete. It's whole. It's full. And nothing more can be added or subtracted from it. The means of completing this work is nothing short of Christ's suffering and death upon the cross, which was the very work that he completed perfectly, and God was satisfied. Salvation is of the Lord. Spurgeon stated, Jonah learned this sentence of good theology in a very strange college. And I paraphrase, his lesson was learned and believed in the belly of a fish with weeds wrapped around his head at the bottom of the depths of the sea in the hot iron of affliction. You see, those tried in the fire will realize that he that shall preach salvation best is he who has felt his own need of it. Have you felt your need for salvation? Have you had the desperate cry in your heart for God to save you from your sin as a drowning man does for his or her, for his need for air? You see, salvation is entirely of the Lord. He's both the author and agent of our salvation. Jonah's few words scream, as James White describes, the most fundamental difference between God's, the God-centered gospel of the apostles and prophets and the reformers and all other viewpoints is summed up in these few words. Salvation is of the Lord. In his sermon, Salvation of the Lord, Spurgeon said, of this profound discovery in his tiny statement from Jonah, he posited no human intellect, not even the angels could fulfill this role or been the alpha of salvation. This plan of salvation was devised even before the, cre the creation of the world and even predates the angels in heaven. Before God spoke the very world into existence and flung the earth, the moon, the stars in the sky from the very throne room of the triune God, he devised a plan to save a wicked and sinful humanity. Oh, how so many have it wrong and an utterly unbiblical view of God. It's not that man sinned and then God said, what do we do now? That's not how it went down. God forbid that we should believe such a lie. God is sovereign. He's all-knowing. And he's ordained all things to come to pass. Which is why Paul wrote in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 4, and Pastor Peter preached on this, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless in him. You see, God would have never chosen any of us once he saw the way we acted. Once he saw our thoughts, heard the things that we've said, seen the things that we've thought, he would have never chosen us, not for a minute. He would have had to choose us from before the foundation of the world. The angels would have sat in utter silence with their, with their hand over their mouth if God had asked them how can justice have its full demands met and yet mercy still reign how can God be both just and merciful with a wicked sinner you see if he just turns a blind eye then he's not a just God and if everyone ends up in hell well where is God's mercy how do these two come together how can righteousness and peace kiss Psalm 85.10 and mercy and judgment embrace each other? And we see this in no other place in all of humanity. When we see it 2,000 years ago, displayed on the cross with God's justice and mercy displayed as he sent his only son to be beaten upon a cross by wicked sinners, paying for the sin of wicked sinners, just like you and I. Sin-sick souls need a royal bath of mercy from the fountain filled with blood, drawn from Emmanuel's veins. Emmanuel is God with us, and this describes Christ himself. Where sinners plunge beneath that blood, lose all their guilty stains. Jeremiah chapter 2 and verse 13 the prophet writes, For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, 
and hewed out cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns that can hold no water. You see, any other cistern other than the fountain filled with the atoning blood of Christ, with his living water, couldn't cleanse one soul for one second. You realize that? Any other source that you go to couldn't cleanse one soul for one second. In Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah stands before the throne of God in a vision. And he sees the holiness of God. He's in the presence of a holy God. And he says, woe is me. I am a man of unclean lips. And I dwell among a people of unclean lips. He knew he needed cleansing from his sin. A prophet of God. And that sin didn't come from within himself. It came from the altar of God. God needed to cleanse him from his sin and make him clean. When sin becomes, as Paul described, exceedingly sinful, when we see ourselves in the light of God's holiness, only then do we see our need for atonement, our lack of salvation, and utter desperation for the only Savior, Jesus Christ. You see, unfortunately, the Arminian believer holds that there's something that we can do to save ourselves. Repeat these words. Sign these cards. Stand in the magic part of the room and repeat the magic phrase. But I would ask, what can a dead man do to save himself? Like Lazarus, he was dead in the tomb four days. All a dead man can do is one thing, stink. In the King James, he stinketh. Our sins stink before a holy God and a holy heaven. And only Christ who called Lazarus from that tomb and said, Lazarus, come forth. Only when God calls us from our sin can we come. We can't come in and of ourselves. The Lord himself must make a, an unwilling heart willing. He must take a stony heart and rip it out and replace it with a soft, pliable heart. He must cause those dead in their sin to live. He must cause those who are dying right next to him on that cross to look to him and say, remember me when you come into your paradise. He must set the captive free and make those who are his enemies his very sons and daughters in the kingdom of God. And that happens when he adopts us as a child of God and brother with the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, besides looking at the Lord of salvation, number two, the impossibility of salvation. In Mark chapter 10, after Jesus spoke with the rich young ruler who came to Jesus asking, what must I do to inherit everlasting life? And Jesus said, obey the commandments. He said, I've done that since, uh, since I'm a youth. He said, one thing you lack, go sell everything you have and follow me and give it to the poor. And you'll have treasure in heaven. And the man walked away saddened. You see, Jesus put his heart, Jesus put his finger on this man's heart that his treasure, his God, was his, was his money, was his stuff. That's what he treasured. He treasured those things above Christ himself who gives everlasting life. All believers are not commanded to sell everything, but every believer must treasure Christ and esteem Christ the Savior above all things. And Paul echoed this reality after describing that he could boast of nothing in the flesh. He said, but whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them rubbish. Count them dung. Count them in the thing you don't want to step in on the sidewalk. In order that I may gain Christ. You see, this was an accounting term. So Paul said, I'm a Pharisee of Pharisees. And he had all these religious badges according to his pedigree uh, in the line of Abraham. And he saw them all in the deposit category, all in a place where you would say, these are my assets. And now he slid them over and he said, these are all deficits. 
This is a withdrawal. And he had one item and one item alone in the asset category. And he said that one asset is Christ and Christ alone. Because these things could do nothing to save me from my sin. Many Jews today, they think because they're from Abraham, because they're from a certain tribe, because they do all of these religious things that God is going to accept them into heaven. Listen, the Jews are trying to obey 613 commandments, and it's impossible to do it because they need a temple, they need a sacrifice, they need a high priest. There's none of those things. So what, the, what are they trying to do? The same thing as every other person in all humanity has tried to do. They try to earn their salvation with their good deeds. I guess they missed the part where Abraham was justified by faith and not by his works. What a picture of conversion. What do you gain and inherit in following Christ far out outweighs the losses and cannot even be compared. A man crawling through a desert for three days wants nothing more than water. You can give him diamonds and gold and all the treasures of this world, but he will die with those things. He needs water. A dead man must be saved by the righteousness of Christ. John Piper said, counting everything as loss happens in conversion. You cannot be a disciple without it. Realize this. For a disciple of Christ, if it comes down to choosing Christ and anything else, you fill in the blank, a Christian will choose Christ. Do you count money as lost, cars as lost, relationships as lost, jobs, degrees, titles, books, even your own life as lost that you may gain Christ? Jesus said in Matthew 6, 21, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. What is most important to you right now? Is it Christ or is it something else? Continuing on in Mark 10, Luke writes, as Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were amazed at his words. But Jesus said to them, children, how difficult it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter into the kingdom of God. And they were exceedingly astonished and said to him, then who could be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, with man it is impossible, but not with God. For all things are possible with God. Peter began to say to him, see, we've left everything to follow you. Jesus said, truly I say, there is not one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel, who will not receive a hundredfold now, this time houses and brothers and sisters and mother and children and lands with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. Now, I know some of you that have come to Christ, you've taken some heat from your families. Those who were Muslims that came to Christ, your family wasn't like, woo, you know, no problem. You accept Jesus as God? That's, that's okay. No, it wasn't okay. There was some serious turmoil in some of your families. But Christ is worth it. Steve Lawson said, if you will commit your life to Christ, you will gain far more than you give up. You will lose your old life, but you will gain an abundant new life. You will lose this world, but you will gain a far better world to come. You will lose the passing pleasures of sin, but you will gain far better joys in Christ. The positives far outweigh the negatives. And we see many watery salvations in God's word. He saved Noah in an ark upon the water. But everybody outside that ark, they perished. He saved the Israelites through the waters of the Red Sea and drowned a whole Egyptian army. He saved the disciples in a vicious storm on the Sea of Galilee when he just spoke to the storm and said, Peace, be still. From a large lake of water to a great sea to a worldwide flood, Jonah was 100% correct that the God of the sea and dry land, he in his hand alone, salvation is of the Lord. It's an act of God alone. 
John Gill stated, all kinds of salvation is of the Lord, temporal, spiritual, and eternal. Not only this salvation from devouring waves of the sea and the deliverance from the terrors of God's wrath in saving the mariners in the storm and Jonah when he was tossed overboard, but also from the grave of the fish's gullet for three days. Through cold temperatures, putrid stench, fish guts, vertigo, sloshing around in whatever the fish ate that which was now partially digested, salvation is of the Lord. All temporal deliverances are also from the Lord. And his eternal salvation is in the hand of the Lord. Because salvation is a work of him alone. He alone quickens the soul that is dead in their sins and transgressions and maintains the very spiritual life of that soul. Nicodemus, a teacher of Israel, came to Jesus, and Jesus said, Truly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. It's impossible. In John 6, 44, John writes, No one could come to me unless the Father who has sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. Now the word draw doesn't mean to attract like one magnet would pull in another magnet. And it doesn't mean to woo as a man would woo a woman to hopefully uh, get engaged and get married. Not at all. But this means to drag by force, to haul. It was used when the disciples were told by Jesus, cast your nets on the right side of the boat. And when they, they, when they try to haul it in, they couldn't pull it in because the nets were ripping. This was the same term used when Paul and Silas were seized and dragged into the marketplace before the rulers. You see, all the graces you experience are given to you by God. He must pull you against your will. And he changes our will. He makes an unwilling heart willing. He's got to pull us because why would I want to come to the very God who's going to tell me, I don't want you to do all the sins that you've done. All the things you enjoy, I want you to stop. Because the things I enjoyed were sinful. Many people, though, when they talk about salvation, they forget to exalt the Savior himself. Remember in Luke chapter 15, Jesus tells three parables. A lost coin, a lost sheep, and there were actually two lost sons, not just one. And they all end on the same note. Heaven rejoices over one sinner that repents. Let me ask you, why does heaven rejoice over one sinner that repents? And it would seem that a plain reading would indicate the sinner repented, hooray, let's throw a party. But let me ask, is the focus on what the sinner did or what God did? Does anybody praise the person who can't breathe, whose heart stopped, and someone gives them CPR, and that, that person comes back to life, if you will. Does everybody say, oh, you, you saved yourself. No, they turn to the person who did CPR, right, like Nick is an EMT, and they go, thank you. They don't thank the person who was dying because they couldn't save themselves. They thank guys like Nick who saves people from death. Who is thanked when one sinner repents? It's not the sinner. It's all of heaven looking and rejoicing and saying, I can't believe it. God yet saved another sinner from his wrath. God did it. That's where the onus goes. That's where the rejoicing goes. Because God saves sinners. You see, there's only one hero. And that hero is no one here. And it's no one that you've ever read about save Christ. Paul Washer rightly quoted in the charismatic movement, they have men in white coats. That blow on people and knock them down. These are their heroes. Many evangelicals have men with build, big buildings, big budgets, and a bunch of baptisms. And these are their heroes. And in the reform movement, we have very, very intelligent men. And to many, these are our heroes. And it's all wrong. They're not the heroes. Yes, we can have a healthy admiration for men and women, saints of old, of today. But none of them are really the heroes. It's not Luther, Calvin, Spurgeon, Martin Lloyd-Jones, Jonathan Edwards. These men did great things for God, but they couldn't do anything apart from God. God didn't have to use them. God chose to use them. 
God raised up incredible women, which you can read about in Christina Langella's blog, such as Katerina Luther, Adelette Calvin, Anna Zwingli, Anne Bradstreet, Lady Jane Grey, Susanna Spurgeon. It's not that God didn't mightily use these women, because he did. But they were not the heroes. The one that they served was the hero. Remember when Mary prayed? Mary would like throw up right now if she heard Roman Catholics saying, Hail Mary, full of grace. She would want to vomit and rebuke them all because it wasn't her. She said, I rejoice in God my Savior. He has looked upon the humble state of his servant. Truly, truly, a servant is not greater than his master. Nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. John 13 verse 16. Paul stated in the same manner, for while there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not in the flesh and behaving in a merely human way? For one says, I follow Paul. Another says, I follow Apollos. But are you not being merely human? What then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you believe as the Lord assigned to each. I planted Apollos water, but God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything but only God who gives growth. But many people say, listen, I'm of Luther. I'm of Calvin. I'm of this one. I'm of that one. No, these men only planted and watered. It was God who gave the increase. It was God who brought life to death. Jonah was finished in his own strength. But God brought salvation to souls that could not save themselves. You see, many esteem servants of God greater than the very God they serve. And the prophets and apostles, the apostles, reformers, and preachers of old would have none of it. And anyone preaching now should also have none of it. Jonah didn't save anyone. He knew the fountain of salvation was not in him, but in God. And we see this because when Jonah was running and hiding and thrown overboard, God saved the mariners, even though Jonah did nothing to have that happen. With no hope of salvation underwater, God appointed a fish to swallow Jonah. Saints, can't you see? It's not in me, it's not in you, but salvation is of who? Of the Lord. He's the captain of our salvation. Can't you see? Can't you realize that Jonah, he had nothing he could do but cry out with the voice of thanksgiving because there's no one else to thank. Who can you thank for your salvation? You could say thank you to the person who shared with you, but ultimately, they're sharing. What did they share? It's what they shared. He could have used any vessel in the world to share with you. An atheist could have taken a gospel tract, thrown it over his shoulder, you pick it up, and you read it, and you get, do you th say thank you to the atheist because the atheist somehow did something to save you from your sins? No! Thanks be to God. Do you thank God for your salvation? Do you thank Him every day, never taking it for granted? Because realize that when God spoke the world into existence, he started with nothing and he made everything. But when God saves a man or a woman from their sin, he takes a ball of wretched, hell-bound, rebellious, vile sinners that hate him. And he removes their heart of stone and he replaces it with a heart of flesh. There's no greater miracle save the resurrection of Christ. And as a matter of fact, when the Pharisees said to Jesus, show us a sign that we should listen to you, that we should believe in you. He said, there's no sign that's going to be given except the sign of Jonah. And behold, one greater than Jonah is here. And he's pointed to himself. The name of Christ alone saves. The Bible says there's one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. You see, there was an argument, if you will. There was, there was a rift between God and man. There's a holy God and a sinful man. How can they be brought together? They needed a mediator. And we couldn't call upon Muhammad. Couldn't call upon anyone. Can't call upon the Pope. We need one who has never sinned, who is both God and man, to bring God and man together. And there's only one that qualifies, the man Christ Jesus. There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. But people are still calling out to Buddha and Allah and governments and motivational gurus, but none of them can save because only the name of Christ saves. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 9 through 11, it says, 
He also has given him the name above all names. And by this name, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Ken Hughes, state, Ken Hughes stated, Christ Jesus has a lot of names. Emmanuel, Wonderful Counselor, Prince of Peace, the Almighty, Ancient of Days, Good Shepherd, the Word, the Light, the Lamb, the Bread of Life, the Alpha and Omega. So what is this mysterious name in Philippians chapter 2? The clue lies in the fact that it's the name above every other name. It's God's own name. The Kyrios in the Greek, which is Lord, which is the Greek rendition of Yahweh, the personal name of the God of Israel. The name given to Jesus is the name above every name. He is Yahweh. Verse 11 describes Jesus as Lord. And every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. We just need to do it before we die and not after. Because if someone's calling on Jesus after they die, he's going to have to send them to where they need to go. I need to call out to him now. Today is a day of salvation. Isaiah 43 and verse 10 says, I am the Lord Yahweh, and besides me there is no Savior. This is how the Old Testament can refer to God as the only Savior, and besides him there is no Savior, because Jesus is Yahweh, the Savior, and salvation is only in Christ. What can you boast in? You can't boast in yourself, so stop doing it. Don't boast in this book or that book or this guru or that guru. Jeremiah 9, 23 and 24 says, Thus saith the Lord, let the wise men not boast in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man boast in his might. Let not the rich man boast in his riches. But let him who boasts boast in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who practices steadfast love, justice, righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, declares the Lord. You see, we should only delight in the things the Lord delights in. Stop praising people. Stop praising others. Solomon wrote, let another mouth praise you and not your own. Don't look to the praises of men. Matthew 5.16 says, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father who is in heaven, not you or I. Romans chapter 4, verse 2 to 3. It says, if Abraham was justified by works, he had something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. God chose the weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose the low and despised of this world, even things that are not, to bring about things that are so that no human being may boast in the presence of God. And because of him, you are in Jesus Christ, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Do you boast in the Lord? Or do you boast in yourself? Well, this morning we looked at the Lord of salvation, and the impossibility of salvation. And maybe today you're saying, you know what? You don't know what I've done. God could never forgive me. I've thought things that are so wicked. I've said things that are so cruel. I've done things that no one else knows. There is no way that a holy God could ever forgive me. You don't know how great of a Savior Jesus is. He is a much greater Savior than you and I are as sinners. The power of His salvation is so much greater, overcomes the very depths of our sin. Realize when Jonah prayed this, he was in disobedience at the bottom of the sea where not a soul could hear him. And yet the throne of heaven heard from Jonah. And you could be in the depths of your sin. You could have sinned so miserably. And no one knows about it. But the holy eyes of heaven is not surprised. God saved a sinning prophet. And God could save you and I from our sins. And this morning, may I encourage you, if you're in Christ and you're in disobedience right now, may you have a repentant heart and look again and say, 
Salvation is of the Lord. Father, forgive me. Change my heart. Make me like your son. May you have a roaring voice of thanksgiving for the salvation that he's given you because he doesn't have to give it to anybody. May you preach the gospel of grace to your own heart and remind yourself of the gospel every day. You see, the gospel is not like a flu shot. It's not what we do to just get saved. It's what we look to to be saved, to stay saved, and to have salvation all the way home to heaven. We need the gospel every day of our lives, in our friendships, in our marriages, in our workplaces, in our schools, when we're alone, when we're friends, we need the gospel every day of our lives. And would you preach this precious Lord of salvation to those that are worshiping vain idols? Because we don't want anybody to go to hell. And the only way they can be saved from hell is by seeing that in the Lord there is salvation and there's no other place we can flee to. And perhaps today, you're very much like Jonah. But you don't know Christ. And you're in a desperate situation. At the bottom of the depths of sin. And you have no hope of salvation. In all the things you've ever run to. And all the places you've ever tried. You've tried this guru and this pill and this guy and this God. And none of it has cleansed your heart from sin. Not one iota. It's still sin stained. Sin soaked with no hope. Today, there's hope. Look to Christ, as so many here have done. Stop trying to earn what God gives you freely. Stop trying to be like the man who jumps out of the plane and tries to flap his, try to flap his arms to save himself. Put your trust in Christ, as that man would put his trust in a parachute. Repent of your sin and put your trust in the sinless one, the Lord Jesus. Let's pray. Father, you're glorious, and there's none like you. And I thank you that there is salvation in the Lord alone. Salvation is of the Lord. If anyone's looking to vain idols, may they look to Christ. And may the idols be crushed in their lives. And if there's any who's struggling... May they call out to the God of their salvation, just like Jonah did. In the depths of his sin, he proclaimed, the Lord is the only place of salvation. Father, press your word upon our hearts. In Jesus' precious name, amen.